know uh, from the look of the room, you all did not come to hear me preach this morning, which is fine, which is, it's, it's so fine with me. Uh, I wanted, I've been meditating on uh, what I can say about our beloved Glenda High. Sweetly beloved. Uh, if there was, if we wrote a book on the city of faith, we'd have to have a, at least a whole chapter, maybe two, for Sister Glenda Hyde. She's been with us since since day one. Uh, and we're celebrating 10 years um, this year. With all my love and all my respect, I appreciate her and um, her faithfulness. I could depend on Glenda High. Oh, yeah. If Glenda High says she's going to do it, she's going to do it. Right. Right. Um, she is head of our intercessory prayer department, and every Sunday at 9 o'clock, she is in the sanctuary praying. Amen. If, amen. Um, if they're going out and they minister, and uh, they take the intercessors out to go pray at a, a nursing home, She's going to do that. Amen. Um, I can depend on her. Yeah. Uh, and over, I guess, 10 years, I know I've, I've made her mad or disappointed her in some ways. Uh, but she never came to me and said, I'm not coming to church because I'm mad at you or something like that. She, she's always been here. Um, thought about this, too. When we first started the church, I would be up preaching. And um, on Monday or Tuesday, she sent me an email. And in the email, she would say, you were good, but you mispronounced this word. And it would have a, it would have a key in it with the breakdown of the syllables in an audio file. Or if I, if this is true, or if, if I said Jacob had three children and she knew they had 12, she would put in the verse, the scripture where I was wrong and show me that this is this is how many, or if the scripture was wrong, she'd give me the right scripture. And I was offended at first, because I was like, I do this for a living. And if I say Jacob had three children, let's just go with that. Um, but she talked to me, we had a conversation, and, and I remember this like it was yesterday. She said, Pastor, I, I want you to be your best. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not doing this to offend you, to correct you. Um, I just, I just want to help you, yeah. and yeah. I appreciate people who make me better, yeah. uh, who challenge us along the way and push us to be the best we can. She's done that for me. She's done that with our church. Amen. Uh, and I appreciate you, and I love you, Amen. and I respect you. I do. Uh, she's a minister at our church, uh, and she's a licensed minister. She's come to preach the glorious gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I'm excited to hear what God is going to say to us today. Come on, let's receive Minister Glenda High this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm sorry, Children's Church this morning. All of our children, young people could be dismissed. Minister Marcus and uh, Sister Camille is going to minister. Amen. Amen. I'm sorry. That's all right. I don't know if I can live up to what Pastor was saying. He's probably going to be taking out notes in a moment to see what I'm mispronouncing. <laughs> but that's okay. We'll work it out. I know that you've been welcomed already. But I've got to take the time to say to you that I am pleased, I'm honored that you are here to help me, to support me in the word that God has given me today. It was a sacrifice for you. Some of you gave up going to your own church, whether you had to go out or whether you attended bedside baptist. But you're here. You made a sacrifice. And I'm so glad. I'm going to be coming to you from two passages of scripture, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, and then Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. Again, that's 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, and then we're going to go over a couple of books to Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. Won't you stand for the reading of the word? 
if you're able to stand. I will be reading it in your hearing from the King James Version of the Bible. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And when we get to Ephesians, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore yeah. with your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, yeah. taking the shield of faith, yeah. wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, yeah. which is the word of God, yeah. praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And the word of the Lord is already blessed. I want to speak to you today on the subject that I have entitled, Put Up Your Dukes. Put them up. Put them up. Yes. Father in heaven, we give you thanks and praise that you are God Almighty. And you wanted us to hear this word for such a time as this. Yes. We thank you, Lord, that you have given this word. And I pray, Father, that you will come through me, that it will be evident that it is the Holy Spirit speaking through me to the end that someone will be enlightened, someone will be encouraged, someone will be saved. Yes. I ask this in Jesus' name. So let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Put up your dudes. Put them up. Put them up. That was an expression I remember from my elementary school days when there was a challenge to a fist fight. That was way over a half of a century ago. And it may not be in your vocabulary, but maybe you have heard of people duking it out. I can imagine that the boxers in the fight of the century only a few weeks ago might have uttered those same words to each other. I have to admit, I really don't know very much about that fight or any fight because I don't like overly aggressive sports. And most of them seem to be pretty aggressive to me. Tell me, really, what is the excitement, the fascination, the fun in watching two people trying to knock each other's brains out? I know the fight generated mucho dinero, with even the loser getting over $100 million. I read it was projected that for every minute of actual fighting, that the winner would earn almost $5 million. That was $5 million per minute. Just compare that to this scenario. Some feel that it is being exorbitant for minimum wage to be $15 per hour. That's somebody else's. Uh, preaching assignment, but right now I'm going to go on, on to what I'm assigned to do. Since wrestling is mentioned in the text and boxing was on, in the news recently, I was compelled to compare the two combat sports. Right. Come on now. Wrestling is a physical competition between two or more opponents who struggle hand to hand in order to pin or press each other's shoulders to the mat or ground. They fight each other in an attempt to gain and maintain a superior position over the other. In boxing, two people engage in a contest of strength, speed, reflexes, and endurance by throwing punches at each other. Their aim is to knock out the other. Now, if you're wondering where I'm going with this, 
There's a connection. You just stick with me. Here's some background on the text. Both the Corinthians and the Ephesians epistles or letters were written by the Apostle Paul to the churches in their respective cities. He wrote 2 Corinthians in 57 AD on his third missionary journey. By the time he wrote the Ephesians epistle, it was seven years later, and it was from a Roman jail where he was imprisoned. Corinth was a large international metropolis that was corrupt and notoriously sensual. Such a community had a negative effect and an influence on the young Corinthian church, but Paul did not <laughs> instruct them to retreat from the city. Rather, he taught them to deal with the situation. You know, we are in the world, but not to be of the world. Yes. There were antagonists that were attacking his apostolic authority. He was being labeled a coward, being wishy-washy, being a corrupt opportunist. So although Paul is defending himself, he turns it into a teachable moment to instruct them in the art of fighting the real enemy. Paul was personalizing his message and writing to that particular group of believers, but ultimately he was writing it to the church universal. Then, now, and future. For as 2 Timothy 3.16 reminds us, and I'm going to quote from the message translation. I go there often because there is greater understanding sometimes with, with words that we are more familiar with than the King James Version, although I really do like the King James as well. But that verse says every part of scripture is God-breathed and yes. useful one way or another, showing us truth, exposing our rebellion, correcting our mistakes, training us to live God's way. Through the word, we are put together and shaped up for the tasks God has for us. I found that there are four points that I want to consider in the Corinthians text, and I'm going to meld them with the Ephesians text. We know that the pastor would say he's marrying them, but I'm putting melt and weld together, and I'm yeah. melding the two, and it really is a word. <laughs> We're melding these two, <laughs> these two passages of scripture. The first point I want to make is there is a war going on. Yes. Right. Number two, we have the weapons. Yes. Yes. Number three, they are mighty through God. Yes. And number four, we have guaranteed victory. Now that's the place for us to give a praise. And because there's the choir saying, don't wait till the battle is over. Yes. Shout now, we got the guaranteed yes. victory. Yes. Now let me walk that home. Point one, there is a war going on. Yeah. Many people don't realize it, but when we became Christians, we became automatically engaged in warfare. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. We gained an automatic enemy yeah. because Satan has lost a valuable team member. Uh -huh. We were translated from the kingdom of darkness yeah. into the kingdom of God's dear son, which is the kingdom of light. Uh -huh. And he is not pleased with that. Our adversary knows that even if we don't, that we are a threat to his kingdom. Right. And so his assignment is to kill, steal, yes. and destroy. Yes. And let me tell you that as a as, as the head of this, this, this kingdom that he has, this well organized, it's an operation that has various levels and principalities and powers, as we have seen in the Ephesians text, he is He's on the job 24-7. Yes. But greater is he that is in he yes. than he is in the world. Yes. All right, noting verse 3, yes, we do walk or live in the flesh. Yeah. Because as a three-part being composed of spirit, soul, and body, this flesh is our earth suit. Uh -huh. Sometimes we think that earth suit needs to be let out, but that's another story. <laughs> the warfare in which Paul was engaged was with sin, idolatry, and all forms of evil, much like us today. Mm -hmm. In addition, we fight battles of life daily. Right. Depression, discouragement, yeah. ill health, lack of money, uh -huh. greed, uh -huh. guilt, and shame. Now, I mentioned battles, and I started out with war, so let me distinguish between these two. A war is a mission that is not over till the objective is achieved, the kill, the steal, the destroy. Uh -huh. 
and battles are interludes that help as incremental goals to move forward to the final objective. So we have little battles all along the way to the big war. Yeah. There are also societal problems such as poverty, inflation, lawlessness, and racial tensions, which are manifesting day by day in our nation. Yeah. When little children are slain in the classroom uh -huh. and movie goers yeah. have to flee for their lives yeah. in a theater yeah. or innocent people are being shot down in a church Bible study simply because of the color of their skin. Mm -hmm. Brothers and sisters, yeah. we need to wake up. We need to realize that there is a war going on. But you know, we have weapons. Yeah. They are not carnal, they're, they're not flesh, that, you know, it's not anything like guns or, or bombs or anything like that. But they are mighty through God. Yeah. They're mighty enough to pull down strongholds. Yeah. And strongholds are those situations that are so evil and, and so entrenched and powerful that they seem like a fortress. Uh -huh. Just think of it, stronghold. Something that has a strong hold on us. Uh -huh. We are in the army of the Lord. Yeah. In Paul's writings to Timothy, his co-laborer in Christ, yeah. he gives his exhortation to endure hardness as a good soldier yeah. of Jesus yeah. Christ. Yeah. And then in his preparation of his impending death, he writes something that we use so often at funerals. I have fought a good fight. Yeah. 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 It shouldn't surprise us that there would be war on earth because there is war in heaven. Revelation 12, 7, again from the message translation says, war broke out in heaven. Michael, who is the archangel of God. Michael and his angels fought the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought back, but were no match for Michael. They were cleared out of heaven, not a sign of them left. The great dragon, ancient serpent, the one called devil and Satan, the one who led the whole earth astray, thrown out, and his angels, yes. thrown out with him, yes. thrown down to earth. Yes. There is an account in the book of the prophet Daniel where a certain man clothed in linen, and we'll just call him an unnamed angel. That unnamed angel appeared to the prophet in a vision and told him that he had come for his words. He had come for the prayer, to answer the prayer that he had been praying. But he had been detained 21 days. Right. That coincided with the same time the prophet had begun fasting and praying. The unnamed angel was waylaid by the evil angel prince of the kingdom of Persia all that time. But then Michael intervened and he helped him by remaining there with that prince while the unnamed angel came to answer the prayer right. of, uh, of Daniel. But he was going to have to go back and fight those evil forces. And not only was he going to have to fight the, the prince of Persia, but he was also going to have to fight the prince of Greece after that. So there are some spiritual forces fighting. Yes. Paul reiterates in the Ephesians text that our fight is not with human beings. It's not with flesh and blood, although Satan uses people, whether they know it or not, yes. whether they know if they've been used, you know what? We probably have been used on occasion, so I'm saying. Yeah. I call to your remembrance the instance in Matthew when the disciple Peter protested. He even rebuked Jesus. He told him, uh, he told him something that Jesus told him that something that he didn't want to hear. Jesus said he was going to have to suffer, be killed, and resurrected. Peter had been with him for three and a half years. He didn't want to hear this. He didn't want Jesus to leave. And so he must have thought that Jesus would be appreciative of him having his back. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, uh -huh. Satan. Yeah. You are a stumbling block yeah. to me. Yeah. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human <coughs> concerns. Yeah. We have a listing of the forces that we war against. Ephesians 6.12 tells us principalities, yeah. powers, yeah. rulers of the darkness yeah. of this world, yeah. spiritual wickedness in high places. There seems to be a hierarchical structure to the kingdom of darkness, a sophisticated government where fallen angels, evil spirits, and demons 
are ranked one above the other according to their power and authority. The principalities and powers of Satan are in a similar structure to that of the power and authority of the holy angels who did not oppose or rebel against God. You see, Satan has tried to pattern himself after God in many respects. According to Dionysus, who was a convert of Paul, Dionysus uh, composed this hierarchy of angels. He said there are three spheres with three uh, angels, three groups in, in each one. The first sphere has seraphim, cherubim, and thrones. The second one, dominions, virtues, and powers. And the third one, principalities, archangels, and angels. Those powers and principalities, are, of course, are for our good. But Satan copies and counterfeits for his evil purposes. Yes, under his leadership as the prince of the power of the air, these demonic creatures wield power in the unseen realms to oppose anything and anyone of God. Mm -hmm. Now, so as not to dwell on the kingdom and give him undue recognition, that kingdom of dark, darkness, suffice it to say that they exercise influence over people, geographical areas, cities, and nations. Since we are aware that there is a war going on, we need to have weapons, which brings us to point number two. We do have weapons. Uh -huh. yeah. Weapon is an instrument or device for use in attack or defense in combat, fighting, or war. Now, with me, I think it would have been very helpful to have all those weapons listed in the next verses. We read verses three through five. I think number six through 10 or 18, whatever it would have been, would have been a perfect place to list the weapons. Right. But of course, you can see that that, was, that that didn't happen. I've always assumed that the weapons were those that are named in the Ephesians text, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, and all of those. But in my study, I determined that the list given there in Ephesians is technically, technically now, is not the list of weapons, All except right. for one, and that would be the sword of the spirit. All right. That list is known as the whole armor of God, and I suggest it's what should be worn into the back. All right. I'll get back to the armor shortly, but another thing to consider in support of my hypothesis is that the epistle written to the church of Ephesus, Ephesus over here, was not written until seven years after the one in Corinthians. So the armor as such that is listed in Ephesians was unknown at the time of writing that Corinthians letter. All right. I rest my case. All right. Okay. So then what are the weapons? Well, you have to remember they're not carnal. They are not physical things. Here are only a few because it's a lot of them that we could con consider. I'm going to come back to the sword of the spirit later on. But the first weapon that I want to give you is what was sung right before I approached the podium. Yes. The name of Jesus. Yes. That name that is above every name. Yes. That name at which uh, it's a strong tower where the righteous run into yes. and are saved. Yes. That name at which demons quake. Yes. In Luke yes. 10, 17, it says uh, that when the 70 returned, they came back again rejoicing. And they said, Lord, even the devils are subject to thy name. Mm -hmm. They are subject to us through thy name. Mm -hmm. Then we have the blood of Jesus. Yes. Yes. The blood you, of yes. Jesus. Yes. They overcame by the blood of the lamb and yes. the word of, the, yes. of their testimony. Yes. The, the lamb, of course, is the lamb of God, which yes. takes away the sins yes. of the world. Yes. And that lamb, of course, is who we sang about, Jesus. Yes. The victory was obtained at Calvary by the blood shed from various points of Jesus' body, from his head with the thorn yes. crown on his head, just pressed down into his skull, from his hands and his feet where the spikes were yes. driven through, yes. from his side where the spear pierced through and blood and yes. water gushed forth, yes. and even 
his way to Calvary. On the way to the cross, he had to suffer a terrible scourging. Yes. Yes. And I would suppose that when he was lashed with the whip, every stripe that he bore so that we might have health and strength yeah. because the Bible tells us that by his stripes we are healed. Yeah. All those places had the blood of Jesus Thank flowing. You. I love Andre Crouch's for his anointed song. What does he say? Almost every communion Sunday we sing, the blood will never lose yeah. this power. Yeah. The pastor says, the blood is efficacious. Yeah. And then I really get energized. I think I'm energized, but I get energized when the, when the choir sings, the blood still works. Yeah. Yeah. So bleed the blood of Jesus yeah. Yeah. over your children, yeah. over your grandchildren, yeah. over your home, your yeah. neighborhood, yourself. Yeah. Yeah. The blood still works. Yeah. And then another weapon that we have is the power of the Holy Spirit. Zechariah 4, 6 says, not by might, yeah. nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. And then in Isaiah, it says, when the enemy comes in like a flood, <laughs> the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against yeah. him. Then we move over to the, to the New Testament. In the Gospel of Luke, the disciples were instructed to wait for the promise of the Father to be endued with power from on high. Yeah. Yeah. We move over to Acts, the first chapter, and they were reassured. It says, ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Yeah. And then in Acts 2, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they received the power. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. We move on to prayer, especially prayer and fasting. When the disciples could not cast the, the demon out of the lunatic son, the man's lunatic son, they asked Jesus why. And his reply was, this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. Yes. Yes. What is the this kind in your life? Perhaps prayer and fasting could address that. The last one that I want to elaborate on is binding and loosing. Matthew 16, 19 says, and this is Jesus speaking, I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Earlier in Matthew, the instructions had been given to first bind the strong man uh -huh. before entering into his house and spoiling his goods. Mm -hmm. This is not an exhaustive list at all. There are others, praise, worship, love, and forgiveness. Yeah. There are also powerful weapons that can be used, and I just want to touch on that last one, forgiveness, just for a moment, because it's been so evident in the news, as when I saw this, I, I know that the, the, the kingdom of darkness had to really regroup. They were really upset. But when the families of the Charleston, South yeah. Carolina families yeah. addressed the alleged yeah. killer, the shooter, yeah. Yeah. they said that they forgive him. Yeah. Yeah. Someone even said that they prayed that he would repent, that yeah. he would find Jesus. Yeah. It really had to, to, to upset the kingdom of darkness. They didn't know what to do. Just like when they killed Jesus. If they had known that killing yeah. Jesus was going to yeah. produce all of the, yeah. the, the sons of God, yeah. they would have had to regroup, take another route. Well, as we move on to the Ephesians text more fully now, we are warned to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Remember, the 70 that went out were able to do these things in Jesus' name. So we have to do everything that we do in the power of his might. Yeah. So that leads us to, to point three. They are powerful through God. Yeah. Now, what good would it do to have all those weapons <coughs> if we are not suited up for the battle? Mm -hmm. No soldier goes to war in his beach attire. All right. All right. Come on. This is where the armor of the Lord, depicted in Ephesians, yeah. comes in. Yeah. I think that Paul must have... Uh, received his inspiration to compare the spiritual armor of God to the armor that was worn by the Roman soldiers that he saw from his jail cell. 
We then are admonished to put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The wiles are his tricks, his artful and beguiling behavior. And when I think of beguiling, I, I remember, remember the first lady, Eve. Eve said, the serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. That was when she was questioned about her participation in eating the forbidden fruit. In verse uh, 11, we, through 13 and 14, Paul speaks about wrestling, but he cautions us four times to stand. He says, stand against the wiles of the devil, mm -hmm. withstand in the evil day, have it done all to stand, and then he said, stand therefore. So if all this standing is going on, how is wrestling taking place? I defined wrestling er earlier about rolling on the floor and pinning people yeah. to the mat. Uh, to the uh, to the mat, not the match, all right. Subsequently, with further research, I discovered that in Paul's day there was Greco-Roman wrestling, which was quite a different style from what it has developed into today and also what I defined earlier. There was only one rule to winning in that ancient style of wrestling, and that was to stay on your feet. There weren't all the elaborate rules of points and pins. The goal was to stay standing and throw your opponent to the ground three times. If you end up getting thrown on the ground once or twice, that's okay. Get back up on your feet and stay on your feet. Stay standing. Don't get knocked over again. Learn from your mistakes and then attempt to throw your opponent to the ground. With the additional information, what Paul is talking about with the multiple stands, now makes sense. We are to stand our ground in the battle, and by staying on our feet, right. we win. Yeah. Yeah. I've emphasized the word whole. In verse 13, once more, the whole armor is mentioned. Yeah. So it must be important for us to note if the term is repeated. Uh -huh. So whole means containing all the elements, properly belonging, complete. I learned a new word in this study, panoply. It means a complete suit of armor, nothing missing, and in a specific order. Now, I don't know when I'm going to use panoply again, but I'm using it today. We can make an analogy between the spiritual armor and that of the soldier. Uh, and the reason that we need to have that specific, specific order is because things have to work properly and efficiently, and they can't do so if they're not in order. It's another reason why we need order in the church. That's inside. One of our ministers preached on the whole arm of God a few years ago when we were worshiping at uh, Cam, Isaiah Israel Temple. And she brought a, uh, a Roman soldier, well, she brought a soldier, she brought a, a replica of the Roman soldier clad uh, in his armor, and that was her visual aid. As you can see, I came alone, so you're just going to have to use the eyes of your understanding. In identifying the first three pieces of the armor of God, they are introduced by a form of the verb to be. It's having. It says, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. And then it's implied in the last one, having your feet shod with the gospel, the preparation of the gospel of peace. So let's look at each one of these, these pieces of armor. Loins girt about with truth is a call to be prepared. The loins in general, on the torso, is the, the area below the ribs, especially regarded as the seat of physical strength and generative power. Truth is the standard, it's knowledge of the truth of God's word. Now for an ancient soldier, his loins were gir or girdled. They were girdled about with a leather belt and it held all the other pieces of his armor in place. It was his foundation. So the foundation of his protection is like the foundation of ours, which is the word of God. That is the foundation of our protection. The breastplate of righteousness is the second piece. Uh, that breastplate protected the soldier's heart from injury. The spiritual bre breastplate represents holy character and moral conduct or integrity. Obedience to the truth, to that belt, produces 
a godly life. That second piece, which is the, uh, the breastplate. We protect our heart by obedience to the truth of God's word. We can then make right decisions, which leads us into the third piece. Your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace means being equipped to move in the right direction because of an eagerness that you have from wanting to spread the gospel of the good news. The gospel is the good news of peace. Romans 10, 15 says, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. The Roman soldier put on his shoes in order to be able to, to maintain traction. He wanted to be able to advance against the enemy. If he didn't have his shoes on, he would, he would slip and, and fall. That's the same way, way, way it is with us. If we do not have our spiritual shoes on, we're going to keep slipping and we will not be able to stand. So we lace up our shoes, putting them on, and then we take the fight to the devil instead of letting him knock us down. All right. The last three pieces we are to take, taking the shield of faith and take the helmet of, of salvation. And the last one is implied, take the sword of the spirit. Yeah. If I were to say anything about faith, asking you, what is the definitive verse on faith? Where is it found? You would probably respond, Hebrews 11, 1. So I'm not going to go there today. If you don't know it, please look it up. But I'm just going to make it succinct and say, faith is belief in what God has promised us. I like the way a certain preacher said it. He said, it's acting like God is telling the truth. <laughs> acting like it is so, even when it's not so, uh -huh. in order that it might be so, yes. simply yes. because God said so. Yes. Yes. Just when I thought I had finished with all that should be included in this message, I discovered something highly important that I had overlooked. Only a few days ago, I was checking my email, and I saw that I had received a message from Sid Roth's it's Supernatural TV show. And it had an interesting video in it. The name of the guest attracted me. In that video, it was Prophetess Glenda Jackson. <laughs> so I knew that was the name of Glenda. You know, if Pastor had us looked this up before, uh, and I saw that Glenda means pure, clean, ah, holy, ah, and good. Ah, <laughs> so I knew that I had to pay attention to what she had to say. I knew that I could surely trust her. <laughs> video, she gives her testimony of her conversation with Jesus when she was taken to heaven. She saw angels bringing in many golden shields. And so she asked him about them. And Jesus replied that they were shields of faith that his people, even his ministers on earth, were not using. He added that he is interceding for us, but his prayer is that our faith not fail. And that was the same prayer that he prayed for Simon Peter when Peter, uh, what, when, the, when Satan was desiring to sift him as wheat, uh -huh. yeah. that his faith fail not. And then Jesus gave her his acronym for faith. You know, we like acronyms because we can remember and it seems to be a good thing. But this is from Jesus. He said that faith is forsaking all I take him. Uh -huh. yeah. That spells out faith. All right. Well, in making the decision to share this with you, I did so after rereading verse 16. And these words just stuck out to me. They were the first words in the verse. It says, above all. Yeah. Yeah. So that is yeah. paramount. Uh -huh. It's paramount to take the shield of faith. Yeah. In Hebrews 11, 6, it says, without faith, it is impossible uh -huh. to please him, yeah. to please God. So if we don't have faith, we, we may as well not even go with the rest of the arm, uh -huh. above all. Uh -huh. So in taking the shield of faith, we can then withstand Satan's attacks when he causes us to doubt God's promises. With it, we can extinguish all the fiery darts of the wicked. Uh -huh. That preacher I referred to earlier made this observation. 
In the movies, when the cowboys and Indians were fighting, it always seemed like the cowboys had an unfair advantage over the Indians because they had, ones that had the high-powered rifles. Mm -hmm. But you know what? The Indians would shoot arrows of fire at the wagons. And when they retaliated, they were very smart because they knew that the cowboys could not fight fire and Indians at the same time. In taking the shield of faith, we can withstand Satan's attacks when he causes us to doubt God's promises. With it, we can extinguish all those fiery darts. Now, we are going to take the helmet of salvation. The helmet covers the head and it protects the brain and the mind. We're not talking about getting saved here, not that salvation. Because Paul was talking to his Christian brothers. So the helmet is for the certainty of salvation, that you won't lose your salvation. Some of the helmets of the Roman soldiers were made of thick leather, or they were covered with metal plates. They had others that were heavy molded or beaten metal. <laughs> they usually had cheek pieces to protect their faces. The purpose of their helmet, of course, was to protect their head from injury, particularly from the dangerous broad sword. The broadsword was commonly used in warfare that day. It was a two-handed, double-edged sword, and it, it measured three or four feet. The cavalry men would, would, uh, would take this sword, and they would swing it at the heads of the enemy soldiers to split their skulls or decapitate them. So they were playing for keeps, same way that our enemy does. He plays for keeps. The fact that the spiritual helmet is related to salvation indicates that Satan's blows are directed to our security and assurance in Christ. The two dangerous edges of Satan's spiritual broadsword are discouragement mm -hmm. and doubt. Yeah. To discourage us, he points to our failures, mm -hmm. our sins, mm -hmm. our unresolved problems, mm -hmm. our poor health, or whatever else seems negative in our lives in order to make us lose confidence and we, we lose confidence in the love and care of our Heavenly Father. Yeah. So if we are not sure of our salvation, we are not going to be effective against the wiles of the devil. Mm. We must bring our thinking mm. in line to God. Yeah. Yeah. The last piece, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This is the only weapon, as I alluded to in point two. Most people say that it's the only offensive weapon. But I say it's the only weapon. But whether these things are weapons or not, if we can use them, we're going to use them to beat to them. Right. Yeah. I don't know much Greek, but I did read that there are three different words for the word, word. And the word that is used uh, in this sense is the rhema word. Yeah. That's the word that is declared or the word that is spoken, the word that is uttered the word that is used. And that is what Jesus himself used yeah. against the devil when Jesus was in the wilderness after fasting 40 days. Yeah. He met the adversary's challenges three times with it is written. Uh -huh. If Jesus feels it important enough to use scripture on Satan, uh -huh. what would make uh -huh. us doubt uh -huh. that we should do the yeah. same? Right. Yeah. The devil is allergic yeah. to scripture. Uh -huh. right. And remember in Hebrews 4, Hebrews 4.12, it begins, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. So that we are the ones who have that broad sword. We're the ones who can wield that broad sword and use it effectively so that we can defeat our enemy. But you know, to use your weapon effectively, you have to practice with it. I am told that a soldier never goes into battle with a weapon that he's not familiar with. Right. When he's given a, a weapon in the army, the soldier has to clean it, yeah. he has to oil it, he has to walk with yeah. it, he has to practice with yeah. it, he has to fire it. Yeah. He can trust his weapon. Yeah. When he needs it, he can trust it. Yeah. Yes. The same goes for our Bible. Yes. We can trust it. Yes. Yes. Maybe you noticed that there was no armor for the back because there are no cowards in God's army. All right. We cannot run. We cannot surrender. We must stand and fight against the enemy. Yes. Yes. What we need to do at 
after we have done this with the clothing is to pray yes. right. with all prayer and supplication uh -huh. in the spirit yes. prayer of intercession yes. prayer of thanksgiving yes. prayer of faith yes. prayer of agreement yes. and those supplications are those requests from the heart that are effectual fervent prayer yes. of the righteous yes. that availeth much yes. And I'm going to borrow one more time from that so-and-so preacher. <laughs> <laughs> he said, prayer is earthly permission for heavenly intervention. All right. The battle on the ground depends on the connection above. Thank you. So in closing, we must get to this good news. Yes. Point four, we have guaranteed victory. Guaranteed. All right. God guarantees yes. that if we use his weapons, we will win. Yes. They are mighty through God the pulling down strongholds. Yes. Colossians 2.15 assures us that Jesus already gained the victory. Yes. It says in having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, uh -huh. triumphing over yes. them in it. Yes. Yes. We then are to remember that being in Christ Jesus and seated with him in heavenly places, we too have the victory. Yes. And then we further back it up with the sword of the spirit. Yes which is the word of God, yes. the rhema word, yes. the word that God already declared. And so now in a war, we need to declare it also. Yes. We need to yes. declare, it is written, yes. no weapon that is formed against me shall prosper. This is the heritage of the servant of the Lord. Yes. Yes. We declare, it is written, behold, I give unto you power to tread on yes. serpents and scorpions yes. and over all the power of the all enemy. Right. And nothing by any means shall hurt. We need to say, it is written, it is. nay, yes. and all these all things. These. We are more than conquered to him that loved us. We need to say, it is written, yes. ye are of God and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you yes. than he that is in the world. Yes. We need to declare, it is written, yes. but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory yes. through our Lord yes. Jesus Christ. Yes. So in conclusion, I just want to remind you, yes. the next time it appears that Satan even wants to think about saying to you, yes. put up your boots. <laughs> First, make sure that you are dressed for success, yes. that you have on a whole lot of God. Yes. And then you say, yeah, put them up. Yes. Put them up. Yes. Because you can roll up him and know that you've already been given yes. the victory. Yes. And then the next voice that you hear is the referee saying, Of the wiles and the schemes of the devil. Yes. You've given us this message for such a time as this. I know, Lord, that someone by faith has been enlightened. Yes. Someone by faith has been encouraged. Yes. And someone by faith is even being saved yes. right now. Yes. We ask that you will help us to be doers of the word as well yes. as hearers. Yes. It's in Jesus' name. Thank, Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you, Lord. 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 With every head bowed and every eye closed, Consider this. Ask yourself this question and reflect on it. Do I know for sure that I have been translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light? If you've never asked Jesus to come into your life to be your savior, you have that opportunity yes. now. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Now is the accepted time. Yes. Yes. Now, today is the day yes. of salvation. Yes. Yes. The Lord loves you so much. Yes. The word says, for God so loved the world that he yes. gave his only yes. begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, yes. but have everlasting life. And he sent his son into the world, not yes. in the world, and that the world through him might be saved. Yes. It's so easy to be saved. Yes. Whosoever shall call upon the name 
name of the Lord shall be saved. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Today we offer Christ to you. Oh, my brother. Oh, my sister. Won't you come? And you feel at your heart streams. It's the Holy Spirit urging you to make the decision. Tomorrow is not promise. It is today. Today is your day. Won't you come? Maybe you, you say I'm already safe, but I need a church home. We offer that you come and cast your lot with us at the City of Faith. We're a Bible church. And we are, we'd be glad to have you come to join our fellowship. Won't you come at this time? Well, praise the Lord. Amen. Come on, put your hands together one more time. Give the Lord a praise. Come on, you can do better than that. If you are blessed by the word this morning, give God a praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Put up your dukes. Yeah. Amen. Amen. I was blessed this morning. Amen. Such a rich presentation of God's word. Bless you, Minister High. In Jesus' name, God bless you this morning.